Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Closing Bell Speaker Series. Um, we're very fortunate today to host uh, Bob Forsman and Mike Holloman. Um, it was more impressive that they actually made it here today despite the weather. <laughs> so Bob and Mike are both experts in international business and uh, have both spent a considerable amount of time in Russia, um, where uh, Mike was the head of uh, the coal division for Glencore and uh, considerably increased the volume of coal exports. And uh, Bob held uh, a variety of investment banking positions, ultimately being the head of Barclays Russia in charge of investment banking business and uh, wealth management. So currently, uh, Mike serves as the CEO of Missouri Cobalt, and um, Bob is the chair, vice chairman of uh, UBS in New York City. Uh, and another fun fact, Mike is actually our graduate, and he graduated in, uh, not from the College of Business, but with a degree in political science. So he's an old. Um, so today uh, we'll have a, um, a panel discussion format. Uh, LJ will uh, moderate it. LJ has also spent uh, a good amount of time in Russia with uh, Bob and Mike, so um, he'll, um, he'll manage that. And uh, because of the time constraint, we're going to save all Q&A for the after presentation reception in Weichelt, okay? Um, so we're delighted to uh, host uh, Mike and Bob today, and uh, you can take it over. Thanks. You know, I really am glad there's so many here because I was taking this very personally. So thank you very much for being here first. Second, I think it's important to thank the people that helped pull this together because it wasn't really me or Irina, but... Behind the scenes, we had people like Chantel Fuller. We had uh, her assistant, Joanne. We had Marissa Langston, the dean's office. And there's people here that never get credit for what is done to pull this together. But why are we doing this? This is for you guys. This is for students to meet business, to understand business. What does it take to get a job overseas? Do I want to be overseas? Do I want to be in investment banking? Do I want to be in a startup company? Do I want to work for a Russian company? <laughs> anyway, these guys... I've known Bob since 2004. I've known him since somebody came down four years ago, five years ago, whenever, in 2015 to speak. And it's the first time it's like pulling teeth then. But I think he has a lot to say, and I know he does, about not just business, but geopolitical, what's going on between Russia and the U.S. This guy moves, he really moves seamlessly between business and politics. Second to that, he's a friend. And a friend in so many ways. We all have Facebook friends. We all have friends. But Bob, I had a tragedy in my family last year. He sent me an email shortly after it happened. He said, I apologize. You haven't heard from me. I feel bad for you. I'm here. Call me. Anytime during night, we can talk. We can pray. That's a friend. He's a friend. The other man, I don't know him from Adam yet. <laughs> but he will become a friend. I know that because, one, he's a no, contrary to my opinions. He's a good guy. He just... And he wants to do anything he can. My first email to Mike was, can you help us at FSU? And he responded the same hour saying, I'll do anything as a no. This is his first trip, but he played baseball here. He walked on. We tried to get him in front of Mike Martin. didn't work. But you've got two people here that are very experienced, have a lot to say. They don't mind helping you. They're going to be around. Don't be shy. The only question I don't want to ask them is something that's kind of personal about business looking forward. Am I going to moderate? Kind of, sort of. But we're going to open it to questions and answers, and you don't need me for that. So we're going to bring Bob up first. I'll say a few more words about Mike. Bob's going to talk to you about lots of things, and then we'll come back and we'll talk to Mike because Mike wanted to learn from what Bob had to say. All right, thank you. It is a real pleasure to be here with, with each and every one of you. I was here four years ago, as LJ said, and, uh, and, it, and it recharged my batteries for several months afterward, just interacting with the, the FSU students. I really I love um, loved being here and loved, I'm glad that I'm here again. Um, I would like to thank LJ. I'd like to thank um, Irina, and I'd like to thank Professor Christensen for um, having me and Mike. Uh, the fact that Mike and I are old buddies and we have some business dealings together today um, makes it uh, extra special that we're here. Uh, as LJ said, I spent a lot of time in uh, Russia 
I lived in Moscow for 15 years. I lived in Ukraine, Kiev for five years. So I was 20 years, which is about the average age in this room, probably I'm in the former Soviet Union. But I want to tell you a little bit about how I got to why I went over there and how I got into investment banking, because I can tell you that when I was your age, whether that was in college or in graduate school, I would use investment banking as the example, the specific example of what I, the last thing I wanted to do was investment banking. That's what I said when I was your age. And I got into investment banking, not for the reasons that a lot of people get into it, but for reasons that I'm about to explain. So um, I, th- last year I hit 50, I, I must confess, I hit 50 years old. And um, I can tell you that when I was your age, all right, let me back up. When I was 12 years old, that was 1980, that was Ronald Reagan had just come into power. Back then, for all intents and purposes, we had two countries in the world. We had the Soviet Union and the United, or rather, the United States and the Soviet Union. China, the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, those were all uh, Europe. That was all a derivative of that main relationship, the United States and the Soviet Union. We didn't have ISIS. We didn't have Al Qaeda. We didn't have climate change that we were aware of. We didn't have bird flu and Zika, whatever it's called, uh, virus. We had thermonuclear war. Nuclear Armageddon. That's what we, my generation, worried about, that we were going to have a thermonuclear war between the United States and Russia. So when I was 15 years old in 1983, my formative years, 1983, if you can imagine, this is going to make me sound like a dinosaur, but we had three television channels. We had ABC, NBC, and CBS. And depending on where you lived, maybe PBS. I don't think I got PBS until I was 13 or 14. So we had basically three or four TV channels. We obviously didn't have the internet. We didn't have have 900 channels. We didn't have VCRs, VHS players. Um, We had television. So all of America would watch the same thing at the same time. So, for example, when Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer would be on CBS at 8 p.m. on December 18th, the entire school was talking about it that day. And then the next day, the entire school talked about what they had just watched last night. Today, I don't think two unrelated people watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer um, at, at the same time. You, you don't even think it's on, t- you just, whatever, you download it if you even watch it. The reason I mention that is in 1983, there was a television movie, um, a television movie, not in the theater, but on television, called The Day After. And 100 million Americans watched it. 100, that's like more than the, they watched the Super Bowl. 100 million Americans. Uh, back then, we didn't have 330 million. We had maybe 250 million, maybe. So, Basically, half the adults in the country watched a movie called The Day After in 1983. And it was about, obviously, a fictional movie about the day after a thermonuclear war between the United States and Russia. One thing led to the next, a miscommunication followed by a misunderstanding and a miscalculation. Next thing you know, the the world is um, uh, undergoing thermonuclear war. So as a 15-year-old watching that, I remember thinking, by definition, nothing is more important than making sure that that doesn't happen. Um, I didn't know what profession that was to make sure that that didn't happen, but I remember thinking, I don't want to be a lawyer, a baseball player, a doctor, whatever. Like, by definition, nothing's more important than making sure that doesn't happen. So when I graduated high school in 86, um, I decided to major, I went to Bucknell University, undergrad, and I did um, international relations and Russian studies. And I decided I was going to make, I was going to tear down, I was going to help dismantle communism, and I was going to make sure that we didn't get into a nuclear war with, with the Soviet Union. Um, by the time I graduated, sorry, 1989, my senior year, my first fall semester in 1989, I did a semester in the Soviet Union. If any of you know a little about history back then, in the fall of 1989, the entire Iron Curtain was unraveling. Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany, the Berlin Wall coming down, um, Romania, um, the the former Eastern European communist countries were throwing off communism and um, moving to democracy and a market economy, and it was a euphoric period. I was in Moscow, of all places, in that time period. Um, I then, so that changed my life. I was in the Soviet Union during that, those dramatic 
months of the fall of 1989 when the world was changing, the Cold War was was coming apart, was was being won basically by by freedom and democracy um, before my very eyes. I then went to graduate school at Harvard, a master's program in Soviet studies. And again, at both in college and in graduate school, uh, investment banking, I would literally use this as an example of the last thing that I wanted to do. I wasn't going to, I wasn't interested in making money and being an investment banker. I wanted to be a peacemaker between, that was my calling in life as a person of faith. I felt that God's calling for me was to be a peacemaker between the United States and the Soviet Union. By the time I finished my first semester at Harvard graduate school at the end of 91, the Soviet Union collapsed and they were, they entered the path of toward democracy and market economy. So I thought, okay, well, my job is done here. And um, I ended up writing my thesis at, in, in graduate school on um, privatization in Russia. Privatization meaning the act by which state-owned enterprises were sold to the private sector. As Americans, uh, most of you are Americans, I think maybe some foreign students here, it's hard as Americans to imagine that in the Soviet Union, every company, every store, every shop, every factory was owned by the government. So unlike some Eastern European countries like Poland, which had small and medium enterprises that were owned by families or by individuals, in the Soviet Union, everything was owned by the state. So you couldn't make an unsharpened number two pencil uh, for a profit as a private entrepreneur. So the privatization program, which the U.S. government helped to fund and to advise on, we were advising our former Soviet adversaries, advising them on selling their companies from the state, from the government control to the private sector. And we spent billions of dollars, not as much as we probably should have spent, but we spent billions of dollars in Russia, Ukraine, other former Soviet republics, other former um, Soviet bloc countries like Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, et cetera, and helping these countries transition to a market economy and to democracy. And I got into investment banking in a very much in a backward way. I didn't take finance classes um, or business classes. I took some economics classes in college and, uh, and graduate school. But I didn't take finance classes. I didn't take business classes. I never took an accounting class until I was forced to take one when I was working for the International Finance Corporation. <laughs> um, it's, part of the, it's the private sector arm of the World Bank. And I was working in Washington for the International Finance Corporation. And I had never taken accounting. So I had to take an accounting class at the Department of Agriculture. I don't recommend that very dreary um, in Washington. So I got into investment banking um, almost 25 years ago, not because I wanted to make money, not because I had a passion for investment banking, but because I had a calling to be, as I said, a peacemaker between the United States and the Soviet Union and then the United States and Russia. And this was the, this was the platform that... Um, that I um, stood on, so to speak, or that I operated on in order to pursue that, that calling. So one, one lesson I want to leave you with is your job can be a, a calling or a vocation. I would encourage you to not look at what you want to do as a career, or as a job. Don't look at it just on a standalone basis, this, this thing that's going to allow me to make money and to pay the bills, and then things that I'm passionate about, I'll do that separately if I have enough money or if I have enough free time. Pursue something that you feel called to do, something that you feel passionate about, and the other things will fall, will fall into place. So I got into investment banking and, and rose to a senior role. As, as LJ said, I'm a, a vice chairman of UBS Investment Bank today. And after living 20 years in the uh, Russia and, and Ukraine, for the last five and a half years, I've been based in New York, and I have two hats. One is, is vice chairman of the investment bank, where I mainly do U.S. Uh, transactions, mergers and acquisitions, um, equity capital markets deals, debt capital markets deals, you know, bonds, IPOs, et cetera, strategic advisory, corporate finance. And then a second hat where I'm the, the UBS group country head, group meaning investment bank, wealth management, and asset management for Russia and that broader part of the world. So I still travel almost every month to, to Moscow um, for about five days. I was there two weeks ago. Um, this Wednesday, I traveled to London for, for a few days. So I'm pretty much every month flying across 
at least six and um, usually eight time zones um, and jet lag uh, to continue this calling in, in my life to be a peacemaker between these two countries. There's, um, uh, there's no one in this room who hasn't heard about the whole U.S.-Russia thing in the last few years. And, um, and it's been extremely uh, painful for me to watch what I consider to be the most important geopolitical relationship on the planet between the, new, the two nuclear superpowers. There's one actor in the world that can destroy every American in 15 minutes. It's not China, it's not North Korea, it's not ISIS, it's not bird flu, it's not global warming in our lifetime, I hope. Um, it's Russia. The fact that we can do the same to them shouldn't make us sleep any better. So the consequences of us getting it wrong with, with Russia are so existential that, um, that I, um, I think that we, just, we have to prioritize that relationship. And as each side takes measures that... Um, that upset the other side, and then the other side takes measures that upsets um, the other side, we risk spiraling into a, a very dangerous situation. And, and now the whole U.S.-Russia dynamic has gotten caught up, as you've all seen, in U.S. domestic politics, which I'm absolutely going to stay away from during today's talk. But it has been caught up in the whole U.S.-Russia, um, in the whole U.S. Uh, domestic political situation. Russia has become very much a, a lightning rod. Um, the so the one, one lesson I wanted to leave you with, especially if you're a person of faith, even if you're not a person of faith, um, if you can discern that there's some calling that you're here for a, a bigger reason than just a job, a calling, or you could call it a vocation, or a, or you could call it a passion. Um, the other stuff will will flow, but you want to have um, you want to be uh, passionate about what you pursue as a career, but you also have to have an aptitude or abilities in that area. So I might be passionate about being an NFL quarterback, but if I don't have the aptitude, the ability, I probably shouldn't pursue that, that path. There's other things that I'm very good at, but I'm not passionate about it. So I don't want to do those things, even if I'm good at them, if I'm not passionate about them. Um, the second lesson, or not lesson, se second uh, piece of advice that I, that I want to leave with you is the importance of um, what's happened to our to our world between the time that I was your age and now with the globalization, you've heard that, you've grown up with that phrase. Now, I mean, so back then it was um, pretty, it was very rare to, I would, not extremely rare, but pretty rare to do a semester abroad. I was one of the rare people that you know, did that. There's maybe 10, 20% of the college would do it. Now at a lot of colleges, 60%, 50, 60, 70% um, of students at a lot of colleges in America will do a semester abroad. Um, most, almost all of you probably have studied some foreign language. But that was pretty rare in, in, in my day. You, ha you had to go through it in middle school and high school, but, but um, not to the point where you would actually become proficient in a foreign language. There used to be a saying, and I think it's still largely um, accurate, that um, what do you call a person that speaks uh, three languages? What's someone who... Um, polyglot? Well, polyglot, that's multiple languages. So if three languages is what? Trilingual, two languages, one language, American. American, exactly, you've heard that, yeah. One language, yeah, is American. Um, master of foreign language. So I start, started from my freshman year at Bucknell studying Russian back in 1986 when there weren't a lot of people that you could speak Russian with. And I, from Russian 101 through to whatever, 400 level, and then... Um, spending all those years over there, marrying a, a wonderful Russian wife and having, we have five children that grew up in the American school in, in Moscow. So mastering a foreign language and mastering a foreign culture, uh, that will open up, not only will it just open up just so much of your intellect, but it'll open up great career and business opportunities. Because I can tell you when I finished um, Bucknell and then I finished Harvard with an advanced degree in Soviet studies, I can tell you that my parents' friends my dad was a doctor. My parents' friends were asking my dad, what is he going to do with a Russian major? In 1991, you know, 92, 93 in, in a graduate school. And they said, I don't know. But I pursued my passion. And at that time, the whole Soviet Union was undergoing this you know, radical transition to a market economy and to, democ to democracy. I'm not sure in your generation what that's going to be. China um, is on fire. I mean, is 
going gangbusters, but that's been the case for a couple of decades now. Um, it may be Africa, it may be parts of Latin America, it may be other parts of Asia, uh, it might be parts of the Middle East, um, uh, it may be some revival in Europe, who knows? It might be in our own country, by the way. There might be a bit, I'm not sure what it's good, but it, for me, nobody could have predicted, um, nobody could have predicted in, when I was in undergrad that uh, the Soviet Union was going to break apart and all these countries were going to embark on a market uh, economy transformation and that I was going to be helping to create the capital markets, helping to take Russian and Ukrainian and Kazakh companies public, do IPOs on the New York Stock Exchange for companies from that part of the world, on the London Stock Exchange, advise PepsiCo on their biggest acquisition in the history of PepsiCo outside of Tropicana um, acquisition in Russia, advising you know Chevron and BP and, and Campbell Soup and doing things in that part of the world. I would never have dreamed of that. And when I was doing that 10, 15 years ago, five years ago, I would never have dreamed that today, in 2019, one of our focuses as investment bankers operating in that part of the world is not taking Russian companies public on the New York Stock Exchange and on the London Stock Exchange, but taking public companies over there private. That's how bad the geopolitics have gotten between the United States and Russia, and that's how bad the investment climate has become because of the political situation, the investment climate for American companies uh, in Russia and the, the capital markets, international capital markets are closing for a lot of Russian companies. So it's pretty depressing, I can tell you, that instead of now taking companies public on the New York Stock Exchange, we're helping advising companies buying back their shares and delisting and becoming private companies again. So, and um, hopefully that's just a, a period of time and, and um, whether in a year or five years, there'll be a... Um, I'm personally convinced the United States and Russia are destined to, um, to have good relations because there's not a problem in the world that the United States and Russia couldn't solve if we're on the, on the same side. And, um, and if we're not on the same side, there's not a problem in the world that can't get worse. Um, that's, I've probably said enough because I want to leave some time for, for Q&A. Um, and, uh, and most importantly, for, for Mike to, to say a few say a few words. Um, the you are going to have. I don't know what those opportunities are going to be. I'm actually going to leave you with a quote from Wayne Gretzky. That a lot a lot of you have probably heard um, this quote from Wayne Gretzky when he was asked about the secret of his success. How did he become the world's greatest, history's greatest hockey player? And he said, "It's because I skate to where the puck is going to be." and not where the puck is or has been. Um, I don't know in your lives where the puck is going to be. I had a sense for where it was moving when I was your age. And, uh, and I followed, I didn't do what everybody else was doing. I have skated to where I thought the puck was going to be, and, and, I, and I got it right. And I would encourage you to think, not where's the puck today. Uh, maybe it's China or whatever it is. Um, but where is it going to be? And... Try to beat others, others to that puck. And final, final thing I'll tell you is how many seniors and undergraduate seniors here? Yeah. And how many graduate students who are in one-year graduate programs and are going to be looking for a job if you don't have one already? Yeah. I can tell you that when I graduated college, not only did I not have a job, I had no idea what I was going to do. I graduated with a you know, dual degree in international relations and Russian studies. I had no idea what I was going to do. There might be family members, there might be friends of yours, or girlfriends, or boyfriends, parents, very likely. Um, if you don't have a job, you don't have something lined up, and you're a senior, um, or you don't have a, you're a junior and you don't have a, a summer internship lined up for this coming summer, I'm not telling you to relax and, and go watch TV and play video games and don't worry about it, it'll come, and it'll come to you. I'm not telling you that. But I am saying, don't stress. You guys are young. You get the world ahead of you. The world is your oyster. You got so many things that you're gonna that you're going to do. And, and um, uh, don't stress if you're a senior and you don't have. Again, don't be complacent. Don't be lazy about it. But don't stress about it. I didn't. And a lot of people that are doing very well today didn't know what they were doing. While didn't have a job lined up before they graduate from college. So a little word of encouragement. With that, I'm gonna hand over to my good friend Mike.
don't be afraid to ask this guy questions because he kind of downplays his experience, but everyone knew him in Moscow, and they still do. This guy moves in circles that you can't imagine at this point. If he says, don't stress, okay, fine, don't stress. But if I were a parent and I'm not, I'd say, where's your job? So I'd make you stress, but that's my lifestyle. Mike, our next guy, you'll love this guy. I just met him today. But as I said, he responded within an hour saying, I'll do whatever I have to do to help FSU. He's a dyed and true Knoll guy. Walked on baseball, worked at Glencore, largest trading company in the world. If you guys know trading, commodities trading, Glencore is the world leader in commodities trading. Went to work for a company that wasn't mentioned by Dr. Hutton called Gunvor. Gunvor is a well-known company in Russia, well-known company elsewhere, but if nothing else, because they have some really known players behind the scenes, and we won't get into that. But again, he's also married to a Russian woman. What is it with these Russian women? <laughs> Dr. Hutton, huh? But <laughs> two kids, lives in Princeton, and they say in Princeton, your house is priced by how close you live to the university, and if you can hear the bell, hear the bell or not, is that true? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, Albert house, Einstein's house. If you could throw a rock and hit the window in Albert Einstein's house. House prices determined by a bell ringing. Think of that one. This is only America, right? So Mike Holloman, he has a lot to say about commodities trading international business. Russia, he speaks the language also. I speak it choo-choo. So Davai. Mike Holloman. Spasiba. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the intro. So how, how do you follow um, thermonuclear war, right? <laughs> Saving the planet from thermonuclear war. How do you follow that, Bob? You just Play crush me, Play bro. So um, first of all, I am so happy, lucky, glad to be here with you guys. I mean, Florida State for me is uh, like a lifeblood you know, of my life. And I, I think what's, what's weird and may sound a little superficial or whatever, but I, it, a lot of it had to do with the sports. And I told LJ about my great walk-on career at, uh, at Florida State. I was cut in the fall both years that I walked on. <laughs> M- Mike Martin let me stay until the end of cuts, but then he cut me. So I'm not really a Florida State baseball player. I mean, I got to practice with the guys for, for a while, but I never played, but had a, had a lot of respect for them. And uh, I, I'll just, I'll tell you this, to, to let you kind of figure out what, what does it mean to me, uh, Florida State, so 1993, the national championship game, I think I was on a, I was in, um, no, it wasn't, it wasn't 93, sorry, it was 96, the bad game against the Gators. I was on a motor vessel in Murmansk in, in Russia, calling my mom and listening to her uh, hold the phone next to the TV because there was no way the internet didn't work the way it does now. So I listened to every play on my Glencore company phone, you know, uh, listening to the games. And I, I would do that all the time. I mean, it was so deeply in my my psyche growing up here. You know, I, I was a scalp hunter. I was president of a fraternity. I was deeply into the the. Um, you know, the fabric of Florida State. And Bobby Bowden was the coach then, and he was like, you know, a god. I mean, a lot of people, Bobby looked up to Nick Saban. I looked up to Bobby. A lot of people have done it. And and it was because he was a guy who did things the right way. He would go into people's homes. He would make friends with the mom, first of all. You know, he was always really good at um, kind of uh, just doing things right. Yes, he was a man of faith, and that's very important. And, you know, it's something that will help you all around your life. But I, I thought of FSU as a place that, that stood for that. You know, Mike Martin as well, a coach who's been here for a long time. I know this is last year, but just a great human being off the field, you know, teaching kids how to do things the right way. And I felt that with my teachers when I was here. And, um, you know, the, the fact that our you know, symbol of our school is the Seminole Indian tribe, which I I hope you get a chance to do a little research about it. But the unconquered Seminoles are, you know, it's the only tribe in the United States that were were unconquered. And it's, it's such a, you know, a great thing to have them as our, the symbol of our university, not a prehistoric lizard or, you know, a tropical storm like our, our rivals have, right? Which is really banal. But leprechaun, yeah, we'll talk about that tonight okay. at the basketball game. But um, 
anyway, I, I was diehard Florida State, so when these guys asked me if I could come and speak, I was so grateful. Thank you very much. Irina, thank you so much. Um, Florida State School of Business, thank you very much. My career arc and career story, very untraditional. I don't recommend it, but um, it, it is something that shows you, you can go to the school and you can get to, you know, where you're sitting in face-to-face meetings doing deals, international deals with oligarchs and billionaires and everybody else, which, you know, Bob and I have, have done these kind of deals uh, coming out of here. I wish I would have gone to the School of Business because I, I, went, I was a poli-sci English double major. I was looking at pre-law, didn't know what I wanted to do, same as Bob. But I found what I wanted to do initially here. I took uh, my last 13 hours of political science. I was an aide to a state congressman here in the state house. So I worked for him and he hired me out of school. I didn't really know. I thought maybe law school or something like that. And he hired me. We moved down to Venice, which was his um, his territory. And I was going to run his campaign. And after four or five months, he ended up being unopposed. So I was like, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit in these council meetings about, you know, fishing over the, over the bridges in Venice Beach, Florida. It was, it was very kind of snowflake and kind of elderly at that time. But I said, what am I doing here, um, Dr. Thomas? And he said, why don't you go get your law degree? I went down to uh, Miami. I went to the university. I went to St. Thomas University School of Law. But while I was there, I kind of really also fell out of love with the law. I remember my legal... My legal um, uh, first class legal, uh, the, the lady said, um, do, you, do you know the, uh, if there's any right or wrong? You know, what, what's, what is right and wrong? And she said, it depends. If you ever learn two words, learn these words. It depends. Because if the facts, if a certain set of facts are one way, I'm going to argue this way. If a certain fa- set of facts are this way, and her, her um, you know, analogy that she used, she said, like, if someone asks me what's the color blue, I don't say... Uh, not what's the color blue, do I like the color blue? I say it depends, it depends. Is it uh, the blue of my shiny new car or is it, and this is what she said, or is it a blue of a brain spattered against the side? You know, it depends. So I was immediately like, come on, there's no right or wrong, everything depends. Okay, enough with law school. Yes, you it also depends on your mood. Depends on your mood, depends on what medication you're on, depends if you've had a beer, yeah, yeah, it depends. <laughs> I didn't like that at all. So you're talking about calling. I was kind of looking for something else. I ended up during my, my two law school years, I didn't finish, by the way, um, I went to Europe. I said, look, I want to see kind of like Bob. I mean, he had a plan. I had no plan. I just went over to Europe. I had some friends in Milan, Italy. I went over there and I ended up coming back two summers in a row and I ended up meeting my, my future. And it was um, some people in Glencore And they kind of liked that I learned Italian in a year. And they said, listen, you're kind of interesting guy. We could use a guy like you in our coal business. What do you know about commodities trading? So I don't know anything about commodities trading. I'll tell you about, um, uh, you know, West Florida um, (laughs) elderly law. Maybe I can, uh, that's my specialty right now. Said, no, no, well, we'll teach you everything. So I moved to Zug, Switzerland. No idea what I was going to be doing. And I, I ended up sitting in the traffic department. So commodities trading. Here's my little bit on commodities trading. Fascinating business. You have two types of of real trading. You have physical commodities where you're out there buying metal, raw materials, oil and gas, coal, which is what I ended up doing, um, iron ore, pig bellies, uh, oranges, sugar, grain. You buy it and you transport it and you try to make a margin. And then there's the paper and derivatives, which you hear a lot about. And that's people sitting in New York and Wall Street or in Zurich or in London. And they're on exchanges trying to guess which way the markets will go. Now, I I didn't really like the guessers. I considered them a necessary evil because they were the people that kind of kept us out of trouble. We used them to hedge. I don't know if you've gotten, gotten into hedging. But um, we used them to hedge when we knew what was going on with the commodity, the price was going a certain way, we would buy derivatives and protect our positions. But what I liked about commodities trading was actually getting the physical material 
and transporting it. And I started out on the traffic desk, shuffling documents around. I mean, they, the guys gave me an $8 million payment my first day of work. Said, you got to make an LC and pay this. This is for a ship going from Australia to Japan. And I said, wait a minute, what's $8 million? That's got to be way too much. No, it's a hundred. Yeah, yeah, what's the LC? Letter of credit. 175,000 ton vessel they're loading in Newcastle, Australia, and it's going to Tokyo for a power station. And I got to pay for it. You know, I, they, they were checking me that I didn't do something wrong, but they, they, it was baptism by fire. And the company was called Glencore. If you ever look up this company, it is really the global university of commodities trading. And they are very democratic with who they take. They don't take Harvard MBAs. Sorry. Sorry, Bob. They, they, everywhere else in the world, this is really a ticket. I'm telling you, Harvard MBA is a, you, you know, Bob, it, it, is, it is a global club where you have so many high power friends right off the bat being in that Harvard MBA club. But you, you don't have to have that. Oh, okay. It wasn't MBA. Okay. Okay. Just to be sure. But I, I didn't have any of that stuff. And, and Glencore is the kind of company that I remember they took people that just kept sending their resume. Ivan Glazenberg was my boss. He's the biggest guy in commodities trading. You look up Ivan Glazenberg. I think he's a $9 billion guy now. He was only in his second year as head of the coal department back then. Now he's the big chief of, of Glencore and the biggest single shareholder. But he was a workaholic. He loved people that, I mean, 90% of it, if I can give my advice on what, what you guys should do, is show up, be there, be there early, leave late. Work life balance, you know, I hate to say it. This is something I think is, is happening in America where everybody wants work life balance. No, not if you want to have a career in the commodities trading world and you want to get ahead. You need to be there early. You need to leave late. Ivan Glazenberg, still to this day, okay, he's the CEO and he's a mega billionaire. He wakes up at 4.30 every morning so he can call the office in Australia. He wants to know who was in the office first, who left last, what were they doing, and why the hell they weren't there earlier. You know, he's that kind of guy. Also a runner, a triathlete, up in the morning, thinking about the business all the time. I mean, it was hard for me to be thrown into this, but I was the second guy in the office. I couldn't beat him. I would get in around 5.45. He would already be in there sweaty from running, on the phone yelling, you know, workaholic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, just workaholic, smartest guy in the commodities business. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Glencore, when we started back in those days, we were 54 offices. We owned nothing. We owned information and people willing to travel. So we had offices and we would call and we would know because we had a guy, a guy. We had a guy everywhere. And we would say, it's raining in Australia. Newcastle's gonna go up, right? The price is gonna go up because it's slow loading. You can start you know, charging the, the, the Japanese or the Chinese or whoever you're gonna sell to because we know that. Well, as it evolved and as I was working there, my grandmother could sit in her bathtub and know it's raining in, in Australia because the, the computers and internet came around to where you, you didn't have that advantage. So what did we do? We started buying things. We started buying mines. Mines, another kind of, you know, really big negative story is, is mining. And, and when, I, when I started, I didn't know anything about mining. But um, mining has changed like incredibly since the, I don't know, the avatar days or, you know, the old days of mining as just stripping the ground and taking everything out and leaving a toxic dust heap. Well, it's not like that anymore. We're, you're required, especially in America. I'm, I'm the CEO of a mine, which I'll get to in a second, but there, there are so many important, necessary regulations on mining that we leave the sites much better than they were. If, if you see the mine sites before and after now in America, American mining, they are all replanted, resodded trees. There are um, groundwater checks done all the time, pH. It's, it, they end up being better than, than they used to be. Anyway, I'm going off topic. I, I wanted to talk about Russia, J just a little bit about Russia before I get into Missouri Cobalt. The, um, the mines? Yeah, and, and our mines, yeah. The, um, the, Russia, like Bob said, I mean, in, incredibly important place, you know, 
Politics and the people are different. And it's the same thing when I was living and working in Africa, when I was in Asia and Indonesia, when I was living my, my parents' military. So I traveled a lot as a kid. But, um, you know, people are the same wherever you go. The, the, the people, the citizens of these countries are good people. They all want families. They want to have education and a roof over their head. They're, they're very similar to us. I love the Russians. I have so many good Russian friends. You know, the politics and stuff, that's what gets everything off kilter, especially when, you know, you have a country that has so much natural resources, but not much else. I mean, I'm very much of the belief we need to engage these people. They want to engage us. They're kind of not allowed to because of the, the political tension between everybody. But I, I really respect and look, it's the largest country in the world, Russia, I'm talking about. It, I, I've traveled it, going to mines in Siberia, all the ports, Murmansk, Vladivostok. I was down in the Black Sea, all over the Black Sea, Ukraine. It's a super important country, and it is the country bordering the other super important country, which is, you know, really coming on strong. And, and quite frankly, it's scary how strong they're coming, and that's China. So we, we need to engage Russia because we need to be able to work together. And by that, um, I, I mean, China is acting as a corporation. China is so smart the way they are, they are doing their, their rise up from communism. They are super intelligent. They are taking over all of the industries that are the industries of the future. Electric vehicles, the revolution in electric vehicles, battery minerals, that's what we do. We're, we're a green mind doing battery mineral technology. They are doing infrastructure. They're recreating the Silk Road. And they're going into all these, these second and third world countries. And they are giving them loans to build all their infrastructure. And then they're saying, OK, you don't have money. Don't worry. You can pay us back. Pay us back how? Oh, maybe we need your vote in the UN. Maybe we need uh, to put a military base here. Maybe we need... And we are sleeping on this. I mean, I, I've, I've done a bunch of business in Africa, and I was in the presidential meetings, and there were no American companies, none, bidding on an airport in Senegal. Why, why are Americans not represented at all? There were 10 Chinese companies there, a couple Europeans, zero Americans. We're, we're scared to death of getting over there, uh, I, and, and that's what I want to kind of say about firing you guys up. This is a very mature market for business. You guys have to do everything perfect, straight A's to get ahead here in American business. And that doesn't mean you can't do it because it's still the, the greatest country, the best ideas. It all comes out of America. I mean, the, the number one ideas, Uber, Airbnb, you name it, new billionaire companies, all thought of out of this melting pot, great nation that we live in. And they're all lined up to come over here, right? I mean, this is, we, we didn't talk anything about immigration. It's, it's just, it's so disheartening. I've been in so many countries and the lines are around the block of people legally trying to get in to America. And, you know, then there's another small line in every embassy in the world protesting America. But the bigger line is always the one trying to get green cards. This is still it globally, where everybody wants to be. You have your Switzerland's, your little enclaves of wonderful countries, but they're nothing like what, what America is. And historically, go back to the, the Romans, the you know, Achaemenid um, Persian Empire. No one has had a longer run of democracy and has done it as successfully as we had have. But what I, I really think is important is to realize that you can go out. Go outside. Take your American ingenuity. You will have a leg up. If you go and work for a company that is doing business in Africa, my friend Selectra, for example, you go to Africa, they're all going to look to you. You know, how do we do a financial plan? What do we, you know, they don't have that kind of background. And we still have credibility globally. You got to speak languages. You got to be open to speaking languages. I speak four and a half. You speak two, at least fluently three Three, yeah. You know, you, you've got to get out there and speak languages, and you can't do that here 
unless you are really hustling. You got to be somewhere. I mean, I learned Italian on the beach because I needed a drink of water. I, I had to, <laughs> I had to speak it or I couldn't have something. You know, it's very, very important to do that stuff. Um, now, what, what am I doing now? So I, I, I kind of retired early. I have a Russian wife. I had a fantastic experience in Russia. I actually got dragged back into the commodities business by uh, Putin's best friend, a guy named Gennady Timchenko from St. Petersburg. He wanted to create another Glencore. I, I moved back to the States, and then they said, no, 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 we need you to build a coal department. We moved, I moved to Geneva. We bought a mine in Montana, a mine in um, South Africa. We bought a mine in Russia that's still working. Uh, that was a company called Gunvor. But when sanctions came, he had to leave. And then the, the guy who's in charge of the oil department took over and he said, why do we have this coal stuff? The price is low. So we closed our coal department and now the price has gone back up again. It's back up to $100 a ton. They're creaming, making tons of money. This is another, another quick thing. I know I'm putting a lot into a short period. I'm sorry about that. I, I have so much to say, but, um, but the uh, commodities is cyclical and volatile. So if you want to get into commodities trading, into what I'm doing, be prepared for bad days. You will have bad days in commodities trading. You'll have big upside days too. I mean, you see the big boats in Sardinia are mostly gold, oil, coal, copper. You know, they're all these kingpins of commodities, but they have their bad days and go bust really quickly as well. So it's something you got to measure. Are you a risk taker? Are you ready to put yourself out there and be in that kind of business? Anyway, I came back to the States and uh, I had a friend from the commodities business, another Harvard guy, um, called me and he ha has a company called EOI. You can see this company is called Environmental Operations Incorporated. And what they do is cleanups. They're cleaning up America. They're the third largest in America at doing, you know, asbestos cleanup, any kind of toxic relief. They had a cleanup job in Missouri to take this mine, which was a former lead mine. It was national lead in uh, World War II. They, they, you know, the lead from bullets, you hear fill them full of lead. Well, they made bullets from the lead from this mine back in those days. When the war was over, Dutch Boy Paint bought the company and it was used in paint, which everybody thought was cool for a few years until they saw you get sick. It's lead based. It leaks into the water and you can die from, from the lead poisoning. So they shut down the mine in the 60s. Well, in order to get the environmental risk off, we went in to clean it. And we've been doing, working together hand in hand with the EPA to make sure this site is clean and nobody's yard gets any lead in there. While we're cleaning this site up and we're about to finish, we notice that above ground, we have a bunch of, um, it's called above ground ore stocks, which are the old milled lead. So mining, we're underground, digging out of the ground a whole belt of lead. It's a 290 million year old potassic alteration, just for your geology for the day. Potassic alteration is, a, is an earthquake at the center of the earth, and it sent these veins of oil, of um, liquid metal up into the ground, higher ground, high enough where we could reach it. The, the place where we are, Fredericktown, Missouri, has been mined since the 1700s. The, the French, who owned all of that ter territory before, were mining this for silver and, and lead and uh, cobalt. So they were getting all three materials out of these little 1700 mines. And the, the area is very, very interesting as far as ore. Um, so we cleaned up this place. We checked what we had above ground, and it was it didn't have any lead in it anymore, but it was full of cobalt, copper, and nickel. So does, do any of you know what, what cobalt, copper, and nickel, what they're in? Batteries. 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 Every single one of you that has a cell phone here, you have copper, nickel, cobalt in your battery, in your phone. And there's enough cobalt to go around if it was just Apple and Microsoft and LG and Huawei using it for phone batteries. But what happened four or five years ago, Elon Musk comes along, he makes a, vi a viable electric car, a kick-ass viable electric car. 
And suddenly the world says, wait a minute, we, we don't need fossil fuels. We, we can actually do this and put it. So now we have gone from several th- tens of thousands of electric cars globally to this year will be over 4 million electric cars. China will produce 1 million electric cars this year. And, and th- this is how smart the Chinese are, the c- corporation China. They have decided this is the future. We are going to make electric vehicles our thing. So they have put mandates in place. They are almost 100% electric vehicles for all their public transportation. Already, silent, don't pollute, all their buses. I mean, they had to, because if any of you have been to Beijing in the past three or four years, it is a mess. It's very toxically polluted. But they, you know, they give them credit. They have put these electric vehicles into um, mass production for public transportation, and they're they're dominating with this. I don't know if anybody saw the 60 Minutes. Did anyone watch 60 Minutes last night or the night before? They had a whole um, uh, episode on Neo, new company, which is looking. They call it the Tesla Killer, and this company is producing awesome SUVs, sports cars, all electric, completely electric. And they are going to be, by 2035, they're going to be 35% electric, the whole country. It is a massive disruptor. What does this mean for me? Cobalt, nickel, copper. All of those three materials are used heavily in making these electric vehicles. So we're seeing a demand increase, a huge demand increase for these materials. But guess what? The U.S. has some... um, Uh, reserves of these materials, but they don't have anyone mining it right now. Right now, Tesla buys all of their battery materials from China, all of it. They're making a gigafactory in Michigan. They're making one in Nevada. They're going to produce lithium ion batteries here in America. They're buying them from Panasonic, Japanese, who are buying all of the raw materials from China, okay? So th- this is a problem. <laughs> I just want to make some people aware. I- I've spoken to a few guys in the administration. They kind of recognize it. But it's, it's very important to-, to kind of open our minds that, um, you know, we're going to need the supply-demand imbalance is coming. There will be a cliff. 2022, the supply will not meet demand, and China will keep all of their of those materials for themselves if we don't do something. So we're hoping at Missouri Cobalt to be the first producer. We're going to start producing in May a concentrate. Another bugaboo of mine is we have to ship it to Canada. So I'm trying to um, get people to allow us to have our own smelters, our own hydromet plant in Missouri. We're going to build that there, provide 600 jobs to a place that's otherwise kind of run down. And it's echo green and powering a green future. Last thing I want to say, the earth, uh, the sun, one minute of the sun's radiation, one minute harnessed, if we could harness it, which we're starting to with these batteries, these lithium ion batteries, one minute can power, if we could efficiently harness it, a year's worth of all human activity, all human activity, if you can harness one minute of solar power. We're eons away from harnessing that type of power. But Elon Musk, okay, South African guy, but he'll be the first to tell you the only place I could have done what I've done is here in America, where our minds are open to all these crazy ideas. And we we think impossible stuff is possible, so we keep doing impossible stuff all the time. He has a power plant right now that runs baseload, renewable, stored off of batteries, power powering a town, a town, small town in Australia where he's, he's, he's um, testing it, but it is solar and wind, and when it's not blowing wind and it's dark, he has these huge rows of batteries that store that energy and power the whole town. Can you imagine if, that, if, if we keep working on this stuff? We can power everything carbon neutral. That's kind of our goal to be a, a leader in America of doing this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I think it's possible. I think it's possible. It's not stopping thermonuclear war, but um, it's baby steps, right, buddy? So that's all I have to say. We'll o- open it up for questions after LJ, but really appreciate being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arena. Go Knowles.